Good evening, everyone. I now call the March 2nd, 2022 meeting of the Hampton City School Board to order. At this time, I will turn the meeting over to our student rep, Mr. Mia Kelly. At this time, Ms. Bowers, would you please call the roll? Good evening, school board members and all who have joined us this evening. I want to share with you what Martin Luther King Jr. once said. If you can't fly, then run. If you can't run, then walk. If you can't walk, then crawl. But whatever you do, you have to keep moving forward. Mm -hmm. We all have obstacles to overcome in school and in life, but we must continue to keep moving forward and always do our very best. Thank you. Mm. Thank you so much for that wonderful poem, Mason, and that wonderful quote. I think perseverance is something that's very important to learn at a young age. What school are you from? Mary W. Jackson Elementary. And what's your favorite subject? Science. What do you like about it? We do projects um, in school, and it's very cool projects. That's very nice. Would you mind telling us who you have with you tonight? Oh, yes. I have my mom, my two sisters, and family, and my two principals. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for coming out. Thank you. All right, thank you. any comments from board members? Excellent. Well, first of all, I would like to say Mason is such a strong name. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and I want to thank you for joining us tonight and thank you, your parents and everyone who's with you tonight. Let's have them all stand once again for a round of applause. <laughs> thank you. Thank right. you. Ms. Bowers, would you please call the roll? Ms. Afonja? Here. Ms. Banks Gray? Here. Ms. Cherry? Here. Mr. Kilgore? Here. Mr. Samuels? Present. Dr. Woodhouse? Here. Dr. Mason? Here. Let the record reflect that all board members are here. All right, moving along to the adoption of the agenda. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. It's been properly motioned by Ms. Cherry and seconded by Dr. Woodhouse to approve the adoption of the agenda. Any discussion? Ms. Bowser, would you please call for the vote? Ms. Afonja? Aye. Ms. Banks Gray? Aye. Ms. Cherry? Aye. Mr. Kilgore? Aye. Mr. Samuels? Aye. Dr. Woodhouse? Aye. Dr. Mason? Aye. Motion carries. We're moving on to the next item on the agenda is recognitions, and at this time I will turn it over to Ms. Kelly Goral. He has a basketball game to get to. <laughs> so Mason, good luck on your basketball game. Get a get a three-pointer or something, okay? All right. All right. Thank Y'all have you. a good night. Thank you so much. Hello, oh, there we go, yes. there we go. All right, let's start again. <laughs> so thank you, Chairman Dr. Mason, Vice Chair Cherry, members of our school board, Superintendent Smith, and members of the Hampton City Schools family. At this time, would Ms. Banks Gray please proceed to the microphone for tonight's recognition. All 
All right. Well, tonight provides us the opportunity to recognize our Hampton City Schools athletic corporate sponsors and express our sincere gratitude. Beth Mayer, who is our coordinator of athletics and driver's education, and she is in the audience. Would she please stand? So Ms. <laughs> Beth Mayer, along with the help from her athletic directors, have hit the pavement for the last 13 years, drumming up support for student athletes and our athletic programs through corporate sponsors. Because of our their dedication and our students and the generous support from our community, our corporate sponsors have donated approximately $100,000 wow. over the last 13 years. Again, $100,000 over the last 13 years. Absolutely. And through their generosity, the division has been able to purchase equipment needed at our high schools to support our athletic teams. Some of the items purchased include, but of course they're not limited to, lawnmowers, office furniture and supplies, football goal posts, those are quite important, mm -hmm. um, outdoor and indoor scoreboards, ice machines, wrestling mats, basketball backboards, that's just to name a few. So some of our corporate sponsors um, not only give to our athletic department through um, Beth Mayer's office each year, but they also donate individually to our high schools and support specific sports teams. An example of that is uh, two of our sponsors that are here tonight, Lametta uh, Chiropractic and Chick-fil-A Coliseum. They recently donated to Phoebus High School football team so their players could purchase state championship rings. So let's give them a round of applause. And we're gonna call them up in just a moment. So as I said, several of our corporate sponsors are here with us this evening. So at this time, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Ms. Banks Gray, and she's gonna call each corporate sponsor up on stage one at a time to provide them a certificate of appreciation. So Ms. Banks Gray, take it away. Awesome, thank you Ms. Coral. Like Ms. Coral stated, we want to express our sincere gratitude this evening. We are very fortunate in Hampton that our entire community, included our business community, continues to embrace our students and staff. Their dedication to our student athletes and amazing coaches is truly like no other. So at this time, I will start the certification, uh, certification um, award ceremony. So we had our first was um, Mr. Tony Mee from Van Costa, but unfortunately he's not able to be with us this evening. So I'm gonna turn the first one over is to Miss Riley Fontaine and she's with Centera Sport RX. If you can join me on the stage. share this together. I'm going to read this out to you. So this certificate says you make the difference. And this is presented to Sentara Sports Rx to Miss Riley Fontaine. Thank you. Come over here. Thank you so much. Let's hear one more applause for Sentara Rx. if I can have Mr. John McLeod from Kona Ice. Come on down and meet me at the stage, please, sir. Come on down. I'm gonna read this to you. This says, you also make a difference. This is from the City of Hampton School Board and to recognize Kona Ice, Mr. John McLeod, athletic corporate sponsor, March 20, I'm sorry, March 2nd, 2022. And this is presented from our superintendent and our board chair, Dr. Richard Mason. Thank you, sir. You make a difference. Keep those replies going. Let's hear it for him. Peter, we'll keep it going. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> if I can have Mr. Kevin Morris from Spare Times Bowling Alley, meet me on the stage if he's here. Nope. Okay, that's okay. We'll keep on moving. Mr. Brooks Heinstein from Sport Hampton. There he is. Come on down. <laughs> this also to you. 
So this one is a little different. This one says, you really make a difference. <laughs> so this is presented to the Spare Times Bowling Alley to Mr. Kevin Morris and is for also being an athletic corporate sponsor. This is also signed by our awesome superintendent, Dr. Jeffrey Smith, and our chair, Dr. Richard Mason. Thank you, sir. Okay, you make it. Oh, <laughs> well, hold on, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Sports Hampton, there it is. So we're going to take a picture. You make a difference. Thank you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Lord have mercy. Okay, y'all. <laughs> Next one we have is Miss Amy Shindale, CHK. There she is. Come on down, Miss Amy. <laughs> Now this one is just, yeah, we got this one. This is a little different one. So this one also says, you make a huge, I made that up, difference. <laughs> but you really do. Thank you. So this is also from, it recognizes you as a athletic sponsor. The date is March the 2nd. It's also signed by our superintendent, Dr. Jeffrey Smith, and our, our chair, Dr. Richard Mason. Thank you so much. You make a difference. Thank you. Awesome, thank you. All righty, let's keep it going. Is Mr. Andy Lucas from Lucas Brothers Insurance? Come on down. Hello, congratulations. Are you as excited as I am? Absolutely. All right now, let's get this stuff. This also says you make a difference, sir. This is presented to Lucas Brothers Insurance Mr. Andy Lucas for our athletic corporate sponsor. You make a difference, sir. Let's hear it. <laughs> Next we have Dr. David Martinez from LaMotta Chiropractic. Are you here, sir? Yes. There he is, come on down. <laughs> Just <laughs> messing with you. Sir, this also says you make a difference. This is presented to your uh, business, LaMotta Chiropractic. You make a difference as an athletic sponsor for Hampton City Schools. Thank you, sir. We appreciate you so much. Congratulations. How about Mr. Reed Witten from Chick fil A Coliseum? You know, I have frequent flyer miles with you guys. <laughs> yeah. And I have a nerve to be a vegan, so their fries are off the chain. Sorry, the salad. That was good. <laughs> I love it. Okay, so thank you. So you also make it a is, difference. This is presented exactly. by Hampton City School Board, and it's for Chick-fil-A Coliseum to Mr. Reed Witten. Thank All you, right. sir. You awesome. make a difference. Thank you. Hey, one <laughs> quick note. I'm really sad Mason got away before I could get an application to him. Oh, shit. <laughs> 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 we you know I'm one for a photo. Come on. Let's hear awesome. it for him. <laughs> and last but not least is Mr. Adam Martin from Coca-Cola here. <laughs> so exciting. Now this is really, this is really special. So this one says, you make the Difference. There we go. <laughs> All right, now, this is presented to Coca-Cola, Mr. Adam Martin, for being a athletic corporate sponsor, and we appreciate you, sir. All right. <laughs> okay, everybody, as you can tell, I love these presentations. So let's hear it one more time for all of our sponsors. <laughs> I need to hush because I'm starting to fog up, so I need to sit on down. down. So again, thank you all for your continuous support of Hampton City Schools, our athletic department, and our student athletes. Thank you so much. If everybody would just stand one more time to be recognized. Zantara Sport RX, Kona Ice, Spare Times Bowling Alley, Sport Hampton, CHKD, Lucas Brothers Insurance, LaMata, Chiropractic, Chick-fil-A, Coliseum, and Coca-Cola. Thank you all so very much.
not only do we appreciate you, but our student athletes truly appreciate your investment in them. So thank you so, so much for being here tonight and all you do every day for us. And Chair Mason, that concludes our recognition for this evening. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Thank and thank you all once again. Let's give them another round of applause. <laughs> Comments from board members? Just one, Mr. Chair. Yes. Um, and I know she loves being put on the spot because that's who she is. Uh, Ms. Mayor, could you come up, and I think it'd be very appropriate, just come to the mic and just give just a little backdrop on how that corporate sponsorship program started because it, it really, and you'll like this, Ms. Gore, it came out of marketing mm -hmm. is, is the reason it was done because we knew we had athletes on the field who could get it done and coaches who could get it done. But Ms. Mayor really topped it off. So I think you need to give a little background on how that. And was. Madam Vice Chair, just before she starts, I told her to be prepared for remarks Did tonight. You? <laughs> <laughs> I said, Beth, you're dressed for success. Be yes. prepared. This is one of my favorite things to do. <laughs> oh, yes, exactly. <laughs> It just gets up there. Okay, um, well, about 13 years ago, I was hired as the coordinator of athletics, and I decided that although we get Fund 94 and it's a large chunk of money to help our athletes, I decided that, you know, it would be great to get the community involved. Mm -hmm. And so, with the help of Ann Stevens Cherry and Carolyn Bowers and that whole PR department, we got it off the ground. and. The community is awesome, mm -hmm. every yeah. single one of them, mm -hmm. and I just appreciate it. And I think a lot of it has to do with your leadership as well, Ms. Mayor. Don't Thank cut you. yourself short. We need, to, we need to celebrate you as well. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Chair, for being my number one cheerleader. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Thank you. And Ms. Mayor, she really is your number one fan, I will tell you that. <laughs> and thanks for all that you do. It really does take a community effort to make our schools great. So thank you once again to our sponsors. Also tonight, um, Dr. Caggiano has some guests with him, and that's the Hampton City Schools Administrative Cohort um, at Old Dominion University. So I want to ask you all to stand and, and, and to be recognized being with us tonight. Yeah. Right. Dr. Caggiano, did you want to say anything about your cohort? Thank you. All right. Moving along, the next item on the agenda is the consent agenda. Is there a motion? Mr. Chair, I make a motion that we approve the consent agenda as presented. Second. second. Okay, it's been properly moved by Dr. Woodhouse and seconded by Mr. Samuels that we approve the consent agenda. Any discussion? Ms. Bowers, would you please call for the vote? Ms. Banks Gray? Aye. Ms. Cherry? Aye. Mr. Kilgore? Aye. Mr. Samuels? Aye. Dr. Woodhouse? Aye. Ms. Afanja? Aye. Dr. Mason? Aye. Motion carries. And next we'll have superintendent and staff reports. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Smith. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the uh, school board. It is my pleasure uh, to recommend to you a budget uh, that is certainly focused on students and staff. Uh, as you know, uh, the budget development process has been collaborative. Uh, it is my hope that uh, those persons who are present with us in person and our viewing audience will hear and also see how the recommended budget further moves the school division toward accomplishing and meeting the goals and objectives outlined in the strategic plan. At this time, I would ask that uh, Ms. Brittany Branch uh, our chief financial officer to come forward and to present the superintendent's recommended budget for the upcoming year, Ms. Branch. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Good evening, Chair Mason, Vice Chair Cherry, members of the school board, our teachers, our staff, our students, and the Hampton community at large. Tonight, it is my pleasure to present the fiscal year 2022-2023 superintendent's recommended budget, which focuses on employee compensation, teacher and staff retention, and also maximizing learning. 
So if we look at the budget at a glance, it does include a 5% compensation increase for teachers and support staff, and that is with no increase to employee health care premiums. It also includes $2.7 million investment for salary adjustments for teachers and select support staff, and that does include increasing the minimum wage within Hampton City Schools to $12. We are also recommending additional positions, and those include teachers, teacher specialists, instructional assistants, and school security officers. And we will go through this budget recommendation in more detail, and also talk about the other recommendations as well. But first, I do wanna set the tone by looking at the budget development process. So within Hampton City Schools, we take a systems approach in everything that we do. And a part of our goal of making sure that we use our fiscal resources both efficiently and effectively, we do follow this five-phase budget development process. And that starts with first planning, then we move to data collection, then we look at review and presentations, approvals, and then it ends with the closeout. So some of the highlights of the fiscal year 2023's budget development process, it did include first, we released a budget development calendar, and we also released a manual. And what that does is it provides a roadmap for all of our departments and schools to know how are we gonna develop the budget for next school year. We also request within October through November that each department and our schools provide their requests for next school year within our financial system. And then our division leadership team, they actually do a review in December of each one of those requests. Then as we move to January and February, that is when the budget committee team, which comprises the division leadership team and also members of the finance department, that is where we look at all the requests and then start to prioritize those items in line with our strategic plan. And then before we get to um, actual closeout, we do go through the approval process, which starts this month in March. And then by June, we are uploading the approved budget for next school year. So we will look at school board priorities because this is very important for the budget committee as we're looking at each budget request and looking at you know how does each request further our strategic plan, and also what are the school board's priorities for next school year. So if we look at next school year, the school board identified some specific items that relate directly to our strategic plan. So under maximizing every child's learning, it includes priorities for the academies of Hampton, student achievement, early reading, reducing class sizes, teachers, instructional assistants, and advanced diploma programs. When we look at attract, develop, and retain exceptional staff, priorities include competitive compensation for teachers and support staff, teacher and staff recruitment and retention, and COVID-19 stipends for teachers. Then looking at create safe and nurturing environments or schools, it does include facilities and capital improvements, and then also continuing our focus on school security measures. So as we move now into what that recommendation is for next school year, since so I've set the tone with what our process and priorities are, we're gonna first start looking at our enterprise fund. So under the Governmental Accounting Standards Board, they do require that school divisions and governmental entities to categorize the different funds that they have. So our school division budget, it does comprise seven different funds, and we are gonna first start with Enterprise Fund, which this is one of our newer funds, which is the Hampton City Schools Instructional Resource Toolkit, or Fund 95. So the toolkit 
This was established this school year in 2022, and what this has allowed us to do is we're able to allow other school divisions in Virginia to utilize to create a curriculum that we have and also our training protocols as well. And because this is a business type activity, we are required under GASB to report this as a business type or enterprise fund. So our revenues and expenditures for next school year, we are projecting them to be a little over $145,000 for the toolkit. And these funds are not derived from local taxes or for any state revenue. It is derived solely from the fees that are charged to external customers. This revenue is then utilized to pay for our Hampton City School staff to provide consulting services to other school divisions. And that does also at times include travel costs and materials and supplies. And I did also um, create a link because we did present the toolkit to the board so anybody in the community can use that link to go look at that presentation for additional details. So now we'll move to our special revenue funds. So special revenue funds, this is a category um, under GASB that says if you have a fund that has specific revenues that have to be used for specific purposes, then this is how it should be accounted for. And we have five of those funds within the school division. So we're gonna first take a look at our first special revenue fund, which is the athletics fund, Fund 94. So next year's athletic budget is projected to be $715,000, and this is an increase of about 7% or $46,000. Our other local funds, that is all of the revenue that is derived from ticket sales at sporting events. And then our other uh, major category of revenue, it does come from a transfer from the school operating fund, Fund 50, to the athletics department or program. Now this increase of $46,000, what that will do is, it will one, allow us to introduce middle school basketball, which is a part of our phase in approach of increasing middle school sports. And you will remember that this current school year, we did introduce volleyball at the middle school level. So this continues that process going into next school year. The additional funds will also support um, eSports within our athletic program. And then as always, we're looking at how are costs changing from year to year. So we do anticipate some increases in game day expenses, such as the cost for staff, officials, security, and also um, changes with our athletic insurance. Now we're gonna move to our next special revenue fund, which is Fund 93, Student Activity Funds. Now, student activity funds, this was formally um, categorized as a fiduciary activity, but with the introduction and implementation of GASB 84, we now report this as a special revenue fund. Now, we are projecting the activity to be a little over $926,000 for next school year. And what this fund does is it mirrors all of the activity that goes on within our individual schools as it relates to student club revenues, um, yearbook sales, uh, fundraising um, costs as examples. But then it also mirrors the expenditures. So if we do have fundraising revenue, there could be expenses that needed to be incurred in order to execute the fundraiser. There are also mm -hmm. faculty accounts that are included within the student activity funds as well. And just for added information, about $874,000 of the projected activity is related to student club or student activities. And then the remaining 53,000 is related to faculty accounts. So continuing on, looking at our next special revenue fund, rental income or fund 65. So this fund is used to account for the activity that's associated with the rental of spaces within the school division. So an example of this would be space that we rent out to one of our custodial companies at Merrimack as an example. So you will see that we are projecting a decrease in the budget of about $303,000, and that is about a 63, 64% um, decrease. 
But what is driving that is one, in the current school year, we did request, and it was approved by the school board, for us to utilize fund balance for a roof project at the Health and Wellness Center. So therefore, as we're planning for next school year, that has been taken out of the budget. You will notice that there is a decrease also in rental income, and that is because we do have a current vacant space at the Health and Wellness Center. And these funds um, are often utilized, one, for any repair and maintenance, so that is the contract services that you see, and then also we utilize these funds to help support the utility costs within these rental spaces. Now moving to our special revenue fund re um, reimbursable projects, or Fund 60. So this fund is where we house all of the projects that are 100% self-supporting. Majority of the funds are grant related, so every single grant that the school division receives, it is accounted for in Fund 60. The total recommended budget for next school year is $103 million, and that is an increase of $49 million, and that's about a 92% increase. You will notice if you look at the revenue sources that tuition shows a zero for the 2023 budget, and that is because we are recommending to move the driver's education program and the non-remedial summer school program from Fund 60 to our Fund 50 school operating fund. So the overall impact to our budget is zero, is really just changing which fund is reporting it in. As we continue to look at the reimbursable projects fund, much of the revenue, it is an estimate. What we do is we look at, all right, what are our current grant awards? And then based on those grants, what do we project to be remaining at the end of the school year, which would carry forward? Often our grants don't cover one fiscal year. They can span you know, one to two or even three fiscal years, just depending on the grant requirements. So we do have to make some projections each time we present a budget to the school board. Now much of the budget is related to federal grants and 94% of the budget is directly related to federal grant programs. We often hear about Title I, um, local education agency or Title VI-B special education flow through and even Title IV 21st century programs. But a lot of the increase that we are projecting in Fund 60 is directly related to the federal pandemic relief funds. So we are projecting that our funds for next school year that will carry forward will be about $72 million of that total budget. Now I've listed on this slide some of our larger um, budgets within the federal pandemic grants and they do include our uh, state set aside under ESSER 1, and ESSER stands for Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief. I always have to read that one to remember it. <laughs> and then also our ESSER 2 funds, which that was authorized under the Coronavirus <laughs> Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriations Act. The more recent being the American Rescue Plan Act, which we title as ESSER 3. And then also we have received some competitive grants, uh, one being ventilation replacement and improvement projects, and also a competitive grant around addressing unfinished learning. Now again, these grants total about $72 million, and we do have between September 2022 through September 2024 to spend these grants. And most of the grants that are remaining do relate to those that end in 2024. So as we look at, and this is really just a reminder to the public on how we are utilizing those federal grants. So they are helping to support HVAC and roof projects within the school division. Also bus replacement, about 41 buses will be replaced and have HEPA air filtration included on them. Also Chromebook replacement, our FLEX program, which was recently presented to the school board that is funded through one of our ESSER grants. Learning recovery facilitators, also a partnership with the community service board to support our students. 
literacy camps, recruitment and retention bonuses as we continue to um, attract you know, the best talent for our students. And then also a program called University Corner. And what this is, it mirrors our 21st century program within our remaining elementary and middle schools as examples. Now moving to food and nutrition services. This is actually our last special revenue fund before we get to the school operating. So within food services, we are projecting our budget to be $12.4 million next school year. And this is a $1.5 million increase. Now, school cafeteria operations, many times you think, well, that's just a part of the operating budget. However, it is a separate fund. And that is because cafeteria operations, they are required to operate similar to a business. However, the business goal is not to make a profit, it's really to break even. But there are some standards that cafeteria operations should maintain. And one of those is that there should be at least three months of operating expenditures in reserve within fund balance at the end of each year. And I, we do have that within Hampton City Schools. So revenue um, mainly comes from state and federal resources and state and federal, with federal being really the largest um, revenue source, that comes from the meals that we are served to our young people and we do receive reimbursement. And I'll talk about a traditional school year since we are currently still operating under pandemic rules. So in a traditional school year, those meals are reimbursed under the national school lunch and nas national school breakfast programs. Currently, because of the pandemic, the USDA has allowed school divisions across the nation to operate the summer feeding program all year long. So all of our young people are receiving free meals through the summer feeding program currently. Some other programs that we do um, participate in at the federal level, it does include the USDA's Fresh Fruits and Vegetable Program. We do offer meals after the school day through our after school snack and child and adult care programs. We partner with the city of Hamptons Parks and Recreation in the summertime to provide free meals for students. And this is students and young people, even if they're not Hampton City School students in the summer. So any student that's under 18, they can receive free meals during the summer through this um, federal program. And we also provide free breakfast for our students who attend summer school programs as well. So again, much of our revenue is based on the average number of meals that were served during the first few months of this school year. And what we do is we use that as a predictor and just annualize that as the projection for next school year. We did include in this budget a recommendation to utilize about $270,000 for um, a contingency from our fund balance. And that's really only if that is needed. We want to be cautious because there still could be some lingering impacts of the pandemic as we go into next school year. We are approved, and I'm happy to um, announce this you know, publicly, that we are approved for the Community Eligibility Provision, or CEP program. And that program is another federal program that allows school divisions to provide free meals to students as well. We are, however, not implementing that program yet, and that is because we're operating under the summer feeding program. And you're not allowed to get reimbursement from two different federal programs at one time. So we um, are anticipating for next school year, if that waiver that's currently in place for the summer feeding program doesn't continue, to then implement our CEP program. And again, that would be CEP for all of our schools, which is 33 schools and a site. Our projected non-payroll, so all of the revenue that we do receive, the majority of it does go to funding food costs within the cafeteria operations. And we are anticipating about a $1.1 million increase in food costs. And that is one just to account for more meals, but then also we're accounting for inflation as well. 
And then as part of our payroll expenditures for next school year, it does include the same 5% compensation increase for our food services staff with no increase to employee health care premiums as well. So that concludes our special revenue funds and now I will shift to our largest fund which is Fund 50, School Operating Fund. Now this is categorized under GASB as a general fund because this houses all other financial resources that are not required to be categorized as either an enterprise or a special revenue fund. So looking at the projection for next school year, our fiscal year 2023 school operating fund revenues are projected to be $263 million next school year. That is an increase of $26 million or 11%. And you'll see that the largest revenue source, it is our state funds. And that's about 57% of the budget. When you include state sales tax, because they often go hand in hand, then that percentage increases to 67% of the budget. We are required by state code to take every revenue source and then allocate it by a specific classification that's prescribed by state code. And those are instruction, which instruction does represent 69% of all expenditures. Then administration, attendance and health, transportation, operations and maintenance, technology, debt and fund transfers, and non-instructional operations. Um, an example of our non-instructional operations would be our wellness center and our pharmacy. So as we look at state revenue and state sales tax, there are two main drivers for state revenue. And all of the information that we are presenting for the state budget, it is based on the former governor's proposed budget that was released in December. And we'll talk about what um, our next steps are in the budget process as it relates to the final state budget. So one of the main drivers is the local composite index or LCI. And what that is is this is a measure that the state utilizes to calculate you know, what is the locality's ability to fund education costs under the standards of quality or SOQ. Now the LCI, it can range from zero all the way up to 80%. And for Hampton City Schools, our LCI is 27.41% for next school year. The second main driver is average daily membership or ADM. So this is, is a projection that looks at, you know, what is the average enrollment from the start of school through the last day of school in March. We are projecting our ADM for next school year to be 18,870. That is an increase of 57 students. When you compare that to our current year's budgeted average daily membership or ADM of 18,000, 813. So with those two main drivers and just um, what was proposed by the former governor, we are projecting an estimated state revenue and state sales tax total of $175 million. And that is a increase of about $25 million compared to the current year's original state and state sales tax budget. Now the majority of that increase, it is driven by one, a 5% compensation increase state supplement for our standards of quality funded positions. And just for context, our SOQ funded positions are about 45% of the total employee count here in Hampton City Schools, which leaves a remaining 55% that is not covered by state supplements. And we'll, we'll talk about that more later. And then also additional state funding for the early reading programs, early childhood program, which is titled Virginia Preschool Initiative or VPI. Also additional funding for staffing for our English as a second language program. And then there was also hold harmless funding for data that was impacted by the pandemic as part of the rebenchmarking process. And then also hold harmless funding in the event that the General Assembly does approve an elimination of the grocery tax, um, grocery store sales tax. And all of that is contingent upon final General Assembly approval. 
So looking at our local funds, local funds do represent about 31% of the recommended budget, and we do receive those funds based on a funding formula from the city of Hampton, in which the city shares with us 61.83%, again, that's 61.83% of residential, personal property, and utility um, tax revenues. Now, as part of our budget process, which I am definitely ecstatic about um, being here in Hampton City Schools, we have a very collaborative process with the city of Hampton. And I think it really goes far in when we are looking at you know, what we're proposing so they understand what the needs and initiatives are for Hampton City Schools. So as part of that collaboration, we stay in constant communication and we are currently awaiting what our final local contribution will be based on this funding formula. But as part of this recommendation tonight, we did include $80 million in local contribution and that is the same figure that we are receiving currently within this school division this um, school year. And just for context, as you know, further showing how our city does support the education within Hampton City Schools, they do fund over and above what the required local match is per the um, Virginia Department of Education standards of quality. Moving on to federal revenue within the school operating fund, we are projecting $460,000 with $201,000 coming from federal impact aid. This is a federal program that assists school divisions for any loss on revenue because there's tax exempt federal property within the city. And then the remaining federal revenue is from the JROTC program and that's projected to be $259,000. And that is coming from reimbursement or partial reimbursement for military instructors pay within our JROTC programs. Moving to other miscellaneous revenue, we are projecting that to be $6.7 million. Uh, one of the largest um, parts of that revenue source is $2.2 million for indirect costs that are charged to Fund 60 and Fund 51. Again, Fund 60 being the reimbursable projects where we have grants, and then Fund 51, the food and nutrition services um, budget as well. Then we have $2.1 million that is generated from our pharmacy, $1 million for Medicaid reimbursement, and then the remaining $1.4 million, this comes from a variety of resources or sources, one being our cell towers, also public sale of any surplus goods, which can fluctuate from year to year. We do receive um, revenue within our print shop. And then also, as I mentioned earlier, when talking about Fund 60, this does also include the revenue for the driver's ed and the non-remedial summer school programs. So moving on, as we continue to look at the school operating fund, not only are we required to allocate the expenditures by those seven major classifications, we are also required to further break that down by object codes. And those object codes are listed on this slide. And I'm gonna talk through the major recommendations in the budget that impact each one of these object codes. So about 75% of our budget is made up of salaries and fringe benefits, and that's in total $198 million as part of this recommended budget. And that not only includes gross salaries, but that's also Virginia retirement system costs, health care, and other fringe benefits. So we're gonna first take a look at what are our recommendations in more detail around compensation. So again, we are recommending a 5% compensation increase for teachers and staff, and that cost to the operating budget is about $7.9 million. And you'll see in the graph that is on this slide that if you look as far back as fiscal year 2017, if this is approved, that means that salaries within Hampton City Schools since 2017 would have increased by 22%. Then as we move on and look at 
teacher salary scale adjustments, not only are we proposing or recommending to the school board a 5% compensation increase for teachers and support staff, but also when we look at our teacher scale, we would also like to recommend investing $2.1 million on top of the 5% directly to our teacher scale. And I have some examples that I'll walk through um, with the school board. But if we look as far back as 2017, again, it's kind of our, our starting point, then that means on top of the 22% increase in wages, we've also invested over $5 million directly to teacher salaries within Hampton City Schools. So let's look at a couple of examples of impact of this additional investment. So if we look at Teacher A, Teacher A is on step 15 within the school division, and this person is earning $53,460. With the recommendations for next school year, the 5% compensation increase, that's an additional $2,673. Then on top of that, with a teacher salary scale adjustment of $1,425, for step 16, 15 through, I believe is um, 19, then that means that teacher A, come July 1, their gross salary will be $57,558. And then when we incorporate fringe benefits, and we are um, assuming that teacher A is only um, within our employee only healthcare plan, then that means that teachers A's total compensation on July 1 will be $82,054. Now let's look at a more tenured teacher, Teacher B, who's on step 25. Currently their salary is $59,578. We look at the same compensation recommendations, first being a 5% compensation increase, that's an additional $2,979. And then because this teacher does have more experience, the teacher scale adjustment is an additional $3,200. So this teacher come July 1, moves to step 26, and their salary is $65,757. And then again, when you add fringe benefits, total compensation package for teacher B is $92,452. And just to give percentages for these two examples, teacher A would receive 7.67 salary increase, and then teacher B would receive a 10.37% raise or increase based on these recommendations. So as we move to support staff, um, we are also recommending some uh, support staff salary adjustments, and this recommendation is an investment of $618,000, and this does also include that increase to minimum wage to $12, effective July 1 of 2022. The salary adjustments impact cafeteria monitors, trade staff, office assistants, school psychologists, occupational physical therapists, speech language pathologists, social workers, school-based finance staff, non-school-based finance staff, human resource staff, and also administrators, which includes our assistant principals and our principals. And there is a link to our budget information page that will go live after this presentation where the public can see a complete list of the salary adjustments. So moving on to other recommendations for compensation or the impact compensation, we are recommending to reclassify 42 employees due to a recommended schedule change. And then also we are recommending to increase coaching and instructional supplements. And these are the supplements that were previously reduced during the recession. So in this current school year, in fiscal year 2022, we increase those supplements by 50%. With this recommendation, this will increase them by 25%. So what that means is those supplements would have gone up 75% since the initial reduction back during the recession. We are also recommending extra earnings that will help support the coordination of our critical incident and stress management or CISM program. 
and then also extra earnings to support professional development for reading specialists. That will start prior to the school year, so this is outside of a contract period for reading specialists. And then the last recommendation on this slide is a recommended changes to school board policy GCBDA concerning sick leave payout. And we'll hear more details about that as part of the first read agenda at tonight's meeting. So moving on to our fringe benefits. So with health insurance or health care costs, um, I would like to point out that within Hampton City Schools, we are self-insured and we do provide health care to all full-time employees and that is on top of our wellness center and pharmacy. And we are projecting a decrease to our health care costs, which is estimated to be a savings of $1.8 million to our budget. And again, I'm just gonna announce again, no increase to employee health care costs for next school year. Then looking at deferred compensation, which relates to our pension and retirement costs, um, Virginia retirement contributions to the pension, those rates for employers and employees are not projected to increase for next school year. And we are also looking at a savings for the Hampton Employee Retirement System or HERS pension plan. And just as a reminder, this pension plan has been closed to new um, employees since 1984. But we are projected to have a savings in our required contribution of about $2.4 million. Then looking at recommended position changes, we are recommending 31.87 new instructional positions. That does include 20.87 teachers and teacher specialist positions. And also we're recommending four non-instructional positions. An example would be school security officer. And then again, there is a link to our budget information page that will provide the detail of the position changes for the public. Some other highlights within the school operating fund, Fund 50. I've talked about our wellness center and pharmacy, but we do invest $3.6 million to run those operations. We also have $4.1 million for our special education regional program costs. We invest $1.9 million to the academies of Hampton, and this does include the $380,000 that the city of Hampton provides directly to the academies of Hampton. Also, $3.2 million of debt service payments. Two million of that is related to the pre-K-8 schools that were built back in 2010. And then new, we have a debt service payment of $1.2 million, and that is related to bond proceeds for Kickatan High School's new science wing addition. And then within our non-payroll budget, and this is important because it's part of our budget develop development process, we not only look at, you know, what are those expenses that will be reoccurring, but we look at where do we need to have some one-time expenses. We can see in the former governor's budget that some revenue sources will not continue in the future years. So we don't wanna tie those resources into anything like a raise, for example, because we wanna make sure we can sustain every raise and every reoccurring cost. So within this budget, we did recommend $13.3 million of one-time expenditures. And specifically, one pot of money is coming from school construction funds of $8.3 million, and we would utilize those funds for elementary school renovations within the existing buildings. Also, $3.5 million to support our at-risk funding program, and we will look at items such as project-based learning within our elementary schools, also looking at STEM labs and things like decodable readers that help support literacy. And then we also included $1.5 million into our contingency budget. And it's important for school divisions to have some sort of contingency in place because you know we go through the budget development process a year in advance and changes could happen with you know, what we think an expenditure may be. So we like to make sure that the division is protected from any changes between what we projected to happen and then what's actually happening within our schools. We often utilize these funds to address the needs if we have additional staffing needs, if 
let's say enrollment in first grade is much higher than what we projected it to be. So contingency funds help protect the school division. And we've also earmarked funds within our contingency budget for any school renaming projects, and that will be based on board action. So as I come, I'm coming to the close of the presentation, but I do wanna talk about, you know, what are the next steps in this process? So again, we are in the phase of review and presentations. So we're still reviewing because we do have to wait for the final general assembly's budget and then also our final local contribution. And we do expect there to be some changes between the former governor's budget and what's finally approved at the state level. So once that is known, we will come back to the school board and present those adjustments for consideration. And then as always, the school board will discuss the recommendation and any updates. And then we will have two public hearings within Hampton City Schools, here, right here, Jones um, Magnet Middle School, um, the first being March 9th, and then the second being March 16th. And then the school board is scheduled to vote on the proposed budget on March 23rd. So before I end, I just want to just reiterate that, you know, this budget process is not something that is, just happens within the finance department. It is truly a collaboration. Finance, human resources, division leadership team, our principals, our department heads, um, the secretaries, administrative assistants, everyone is a part of this budget recommendation so i just want to publicly thank everyone for their participation and that does conclude tonight's presentation and i'm happy to answer any questions thank you thank you very much miss branch <laughs> i keep wanting to say dorch but branch <laughs> All right, make myself a personal note. At this time, I'll ask board members if they have any questions for Ms. Branch. Ms. Banks Ray? Don't actually have any questions because you always um, just, you do a phenomenal job, Ms. Branch. Um, and I just wanted to uh, give the team accolades. Um, it's so refreshing to come into a meeting um, you know, we always have behind the scenes meetings and about the budget and it's not an easy process. And so I wanna give you and the team just your, your kudos and accolades for always presenting such a well-informed, detailed budget recommendation. Um, and there's just so, so many areas that I can highlight that just makes my heart sing. I mean, just you reiterate it so many times that there are no increase to the employee healthcare premiums. That's huge in the day we live. That's absolutely huge. So I like that um, to say that 5% compensation increase for our staff and teachers. And that just goes back to the premise of we're always wanting to attract, develop, and retain exceptional staff. So thank you for that minimum wage increase. Thank you so much. And I'm always so excited to see you guys highlight our continued collaboration with the city of Hampton. So mm -hmm. thank you so much and I appreciate the presentation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Right. Any other comments or questions? Yes, thank you, mm -hmm. Mr. Chair. Um, I just want to reiterate, as you know, Ms. Branch, um, you and your team, and even the people who used to work here, um, get together and um, at budget time and do such an outstanding job. Mm -hmm. I, I have to also agree with Ms. Banks Gray when you talk about our collaboration with the city of Hampton, that is huge. Mm -hmm. The fact that they fund us above what they have to do. You don't find that in many cities. Yes. In fact, in a lot of cities, you don't even find them funding where they need to be. Mm -hmm. So I, I know we're blessed you know, in that respect. Mm -hmm. I also wanna thank Dr. Smith and the team for this budget at a glance mm -hmm. is awesome and it's good news. Mm -hmm. So I, I appreciate it because it does show that we have a sustainable budget as yes. well, which is important. Mm -hmm. I would like to just ask just a couple of questions, but before I do, I do have one comment, and I'm happy to see that we talked about the ESSER funds, because I think we need to note on camera that Congressman Bobby Scott did a great job in mm -hmm. pushing everything he could for Hampton City Schools. He put us in good stead. Yes. And we appreciate another yes. partnership mm -hmm. as you look at that. Mm -hmm. Could you just briefly, just for those who may not understand, 
just give a brief overview of how we get revenue from cell towers. Yes, so we have contracts with different um, cell phone companies and they are utilizing our locations to have cell towers so it's kind of like renting you know space for those cell towers to be housed and then they provide us um, monthly revenue for utilizing our space where they're located mm -hmm. okay thank you i think that kind of asks you know answers a question before it's asked mm -hmm. of people who may not understand that and the last piece is, and I hate to put you on the spot, Ms. Banks Gray, but you talked about additional funding to support our CISM program, and you were such a key component of that coming to fruition. Mm -hmm. Could you just kind of explain to everybody just what that is, what it does, and why it's so important to the division? Yes, ma'am. So this is a critical incident um, uh, program, and the reason why I, I was so uh, such a huge advocate for it is that we're having so many trauma flare-ups we see in, the, in uh, the news on a daily basis. And this is something that um, our young people, we need to have um, not only having our, um, our actual teachers and staff trained in these particular areas so they can come to you know, our, our actual um, providers and have them educated in certain areas in trauma. And um, this was something that was just, it was key, and it was something that we needed in the schools that we were lacking. And so that was a program that, you know, I decided, you know, let's go ahead and, and give a push to this. Mm -hmm. um, so it was, it's something that is critical that we need for the 21st century um, staff at this point. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks. I don't have anything else. Any other questions? Mr. Samuels? I do have two comments that I would like to make. And I know my partner, Joe, is smiling behind his mask <laughs> as Ms. Um, Branch um, reported out on this budget because, Joe, you remember there was one time when uh, we were in the red Where and we weren't able to give um, staff and teachers increase for the many years that Joe and I served on the board. And I know that Joe is very, and I also are very appreciative of the hard work um, that is put in place to make sure that our teachers are compensated because um, this will benefit teachers because as you know, we're being faced with um, cost of living increase and inflation. Inflation just this year has gone up approximately 9%. And so this was a very intentional budget on your part and Dr. Smith's part to make sure that that is offset um, inflation. Um, my second comment is relating to the, um, the sick leave. And as you know that, um, um, and I'm so appreciative of Dr. Smith's um, leadership in, with this initiative, um, this is something that I um, when I first came on board and I looked at that policy, I felt as if that individual who have been employed with the city of Hampton over the years have earned not just sick leave, but vacation leave. And when they decide to um, resign from the school division, they should be entitled to um, some sort of compensation for um, um, the time that they served um, with us. And I remember myself and Ms. Cherry having a conversation with Dr. Smith to really look at that um, policy when he first came on board. And I am so appreciative that this year we are going to be able to make some changes to that policy because that will also support um, our retention, our recruitment and retention of staff, knowing that if they decide to resign after serving five or more years with the division, they can walk away with not only their vacation leave, but also their sick leave, a portion of their sick leave. So I'm very much appreciative of Dr. Smith, and I'm looking to you, Dr. Smith, for you know, um, working through that, and, and, and um, we meet somewhere. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we got that. <laughs> and also, Mr. Chair, um, yes. to piggyback on Mr. Samuel's comment, I think it's huge, and you stated it, but I think it's huge that when you look at 2017, if this budget, if this recommended budget is approved, that means salaries in Hampton City Schools will have increased by 22%. Yes. 
that's, that's, that's major. Mm -hmm. But it also speaks to what Dr. Smith talks about a lot, the human capital. We have mm -hmm. to recognize that. And, yeah. and this shows that we in fact do in Hampton City Schools. So thank you. Any other comments from board members or questions? All right, well thank you Ms. Branch for all of your hard work, you and your team. Um, also thank you to fellow board members as well as members of city council with all of the behind the scenes meetings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, just to let the community know, there's a lot of work that goes into putting this budget together and so many moving parts. I wanna thank you all for your time and effort with everything that's, that's been done. And city council, if you're watching, thank you as well. We'll have more opportunities to talk about the budget as we continue in this process. So, Dr. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and um, Ms. Branch, thank you for doing such an outstanding job. This is like my 14th year uh, as superintendent and um, 12 of which I have, I have had an opportunity to present the budget. Uh, the last two uh, with Ms. Branch and I will tell you that this evening uh, was absolutely the best. Mm -hmm. And so I want to thank you for that. Thank you for that. I would ask that members of the finance team and uh, all of the thank yous, I know members of the division leadership team and human resources, uh, individuals who are present, um, at, who were involved in the budget process, please stand because we want you to be recognized for all of your hard work and uh, we so appreciate you. Please stand. Thank you for an outstanding job. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, that concludes uh, the recommended budget and uh, we'll now move uh, uh, to the 2022-2023 school calendar, proposed calendar, and also the planning calendar. I think uh, Dr. Haynes, our chief of secondary schools, and Dr. Kate Maxlow uh, will present the proposed uh, calendar and the proposed planning calendar for the following school year. Thank you. Dr. Haynes? I tried my hardest to go before Ms. Branch. He did. <laughs> <laughs> he wanted me to reorder the agenda. I said, I don't have the authority to do that. <laughs> but we will uh, present the recommended calendars to you. Good evening, Chairman Mason, Vice Chair Cherry, members of the board, Doc Smith, and members of the Hampton community. This year, as you know, as part of the calendar process, you are aware that we administ administered a survey regarding the opening date for the 22-23 school year. Of course, you will hear the results of that survey and you're able to access them through board docs. At this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Kate Maxlow, our Director of Innovation and Professional Learning, to go through the presentation and then we will entertain any questions that you may have concluding it. All right, thank you, Dr. Haynes, and good evening. Um, so our purpose here today is to recommend a two-year calendar that does support continuous improvement of student achievement and professional learning for our employees. Uh, we are going to review the feedback on the 22-23 and 23-24 draft calendars and then uh, continues to support the regional calendar agreement to the greatest extent possible. As you know, we share many students with New Horizons between Newport News and York County, Williamsburg, James City County, Pocosin, and Gloucester. Um, so we did have several people on our committee, including some parents, teachers, support personnel, community members, and administrators. Uh, you can see the people who are on our team here. Uh, there were several important factors that we needed to consider. For instance, we needed to develop a calendar that of course meets the Code of Virginia requirements as well as school division considerations. We did want to explore potential regional impact um, and then also provide for school closings due to severe inclement weather, professional learning, parent-teacher conferences, school learning plan related activities, teacher work days and breaks. Um, so here you can see the process that we used to develop the calendar. Uh, first, we um, incorporated any regional calendar decisions to the greatest extent possible. Uh, we did publicize the proposed calendars and we solicited feedback through that division-wide calendar survey, which was posted on our website. We also sent it through email and we sent a phone message out to all parents and staff so that they would know that the survey was open. Um, we received and reviewed the feedback uh, from HCS staff and parents and then Based upon that, uh, we made adjustments. 
So without further ado, here is the response. Um, so as you can see, it was very close, and this is the first year in three years that we have actually had the majority of people filling out the survey um, vote for a pre-Labor Day opening. Uh, so we had 51.3% ask to begin on Monday, August 29th, um, with 48.7% asking to begin on Tuesday, September the 6th for 2022. To break down the data a little bit more for you right here, um, you can see that of those who identified solely as employees, 59% preferred opening on August 29th. And of those who identified as both parents and guardians and employees, because many of our staff have students who go here as well, 58% still preferred opening on August 29th and 56% of students also preferred opening on August 29th. Um, so of those who identified as parents or guardians, only 54% of them preferred opening on September 6th, so 46% uh, preferring to open on August the 29th. So after a lot of debate and discussion and reviewing of the results, um, the calendar that we are presenting to you for consideration today does have that opening date of Monday, August 29th, 2022. Um, and I'm gonna go through some of the reasonings for that in just a second. But uh, it does depict instructional and non-instructional days for the next two years. It will, as it usually does, build in six early release days for elementary and middle school students for two hours. Early release, it will also build in two early dismissal days for all students, again, two hours, um, and all staff with normal hours with afternoon PD. It has two early close days for all staff and students, and then also two full weeks for winter break. Um, so 10 instructional days. If we had opened post Labor Day, we would not have been able to do the full two weeks at winter break. Mm -hmm. So a few other key points, um, as we usually do, we will still have our seven pre-service days for the school learning plan, PD, and teacher work days. Uh, we will still have our half day of division-wide professional development for elementary, middle, and high school in November. We still have that one day for regional professional development that takes place um, usually at the end of January, that break after the first semester, and then one unencumbered teacher work day at the end of the first semester as well. Um, additional information, we will have one banked student instructional day, and uh, the calendar advises that any additional missed days can be made up at the discretion of the superintendent, which can include up to 10 virtual learning days per Virginia code. Uh, we will also have, like we talked about, those two early close days, which are going to be the Friday before winter break and the Friday before Memorial Day. We'll have those two full weeks for winter break, um, and then spring break will continue to be that first full week in April. And then uh, Monday, June 12th, will be the last day for students, and Tuesday, June 13th, as the last day for teachers. So. Why did we decide with the pre-Labor Day start? Well, you saw the survey information um, and it was very close. But what we have found out is that um, York County and Williamsburg already went to a pre-Labor Day start last this, this school year. Newport News has just de decided that they are also going to have a pre-Labor Day start next year starting on August 29th as our WJCC in York County. Um, and I just heard that Gloucester also is going to be opening on August the 29th. So that leaves, of all the ones that we share with uh, New Horizons with that, only leaves Pocosin, um, who I have yet to hear about. Mm -hmm. So knowing how many of our teachers may live in other districts or how many of our staff may live in other districts, um, that would make it very complicated to have different opening days, different winter breaks, mm -hmm. et cetera. That was one of our big reasons. The other, we had several teachers and parents asking for that full two weeks at winter break. Uh, we've had that since uh, 2017, 2018, and people really enjoy it. Um, <laughs> so that, but also very, very importantly for our students, our students will receive more instructional time for their high stakes standardized tests. Um, such as their standards of learning tests, um, advanced placement tests, or IB tests. We don't get to set those test dates. They usually happen either in May or early June. So every instructional day before then obviously counts. Yes, we could start later, but then we would add days to the end of the calendar, which is after a lot of these high stakes tests. And especially if all of the other students in our area are starting earlier, then they're getting more days before the actual tests take place. 
Um, we also felt it was important to continue to close on election day. It is a holiday, but also many of our elementary schools are used as polling stations. Um, and we felt that for safety concerns, we really need to have our schools closed to mm -hmm. students on um, election day. So that we weren't gonna be able to open that one to make up for that two weeks at winter break. And also the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. Um, I know that since I have been here, I started in 2014, we have had that Wednesday before Thanksgiving off and that is now expected. A lot of people mm -hmm. also plan their travel plans around that. So yeah. we could have made up a day there, but we didn't want to disrupt and all of the other school divisions around here also take that Wednesday off too. Mm -hmm. So um, those are some of the reasonings why we went with that pre Labor Day opening. A few other questions that we got on the survey. Um, why aren't we building in more inclement weather days? Why can't we just have students get out later um, and have, or why can't we build in 181, 182 days as opposed to the 180? Well, if we did that, we would either have less time for holidays or we would have to extend the year. Um, and again, if we extend the year, that often gets students the learning after they really need it. So again, after those standardized tests take place. We are now, with our being able to use those 10 virtual learning days for inclement weather means that we have the opportunity to make up the learning right away when students need it, um, or at the discretion of the superintendent based upon whatever the circumstances are. We have several different options that we could use, which is why we're keeping it to 180 days with one instructional day banked in there, knowing that we have all of those other options as well. Um, this was probably the biggest feedback that we received was about what if we already have a family vacation planned for the week of August 29th. Um, and we are very aware that some of our families are very organized and plan things far in advance. I'm already looking forward to my November trip. Um, and so I don't, I don't need to take off, well, for this, anyway. Um, so, but we do have it in our policy where it says prearranged appointments um, can be with the building administrator or designee approval can be excused. We also are um, saying that we would like to have a potentially look into other options such as asynchronous learning that students can do that may be posted uh, as early as August 1st so that students can do this if they want to um, or other ways that we can help students who have to miss that first week because they already have things planned um, get them going in school this year without having to miss too much or without any um, unintended consequences to their grades or absences. Um, so, And then we also received some questions about graduation and whether this would move the graduation dates. Again, people put those graduation dates on their calendars years ahead of time. Uh, we actually book with the, Col the Hampton Coliseum years ahead of time as well. Um, this year, we're only going to be getting out of school two days earlier than normal because we're using two of the other four days that we're getting at winter break. Um, so we would not need to reschedule the Coliseum. Uh, we do have some high school teachers who are expected to be at graduation, but they don't have to work between their last day and graduation, um, although they are still going to be expected to walk at graduation. So at this time, I will be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Right. Any questions from board members or comments? Great, or a thorough process. Thank you so much. All right, Dr. Thank Maxlow. You. Okay, we'll bring this back uh, to the board. Uh, the final uh, report for superintendent and staff reports uh, will be the financial report then. We would ask Ms. Branch um, if you would kindly return. Hopefully you've had an opportunity to get uh, some water there, right? I do. Okay. <laughs> Good evening again. Um, tonight I'll be presenting the January 2020 monthly operating report. Um, through the end of January, our revenues totaled $113 million and were 7.43% higher when compared to the previous fiscal year. Um, this difference is driven by the timing of our payments from the city of Hampton, which always varies from month to month because we get that payment based on monthly cash flow needs. And then also, state funding has increased from 2021 school year to the current school year in 2022. 
Our cumulative expenditures and encumbrances, they totaled $145 million. This is 13.3% higher compared to the prior fiscal year. Um, that difference is being driven by operations and technology capital projects. And then also compensation or salaries and benefit costs are higher compared to last year in 2021 compared to this current school year. And those changes are in line with what the school board approved for the 2022's compensation budget. And as always included in the report, you have a list of transfers to and from the technology classification at the end of January, 2022. That does conclude tonight's report. All right, thank you very much. Questions or comments from board members, Mr. Samuel? Yes, uh, thanks, Ms. Branch. I have uh, actually three questions and um, two other questions related to you. Uh, page four on the comparative statement of revenue expenditure and 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 on I see that there is when when we when we're discussing the federal funds I see that there's a difference of a hundred and thirty three point eight percent and then we move down on to transportation there's a difference of forty four percent can you just give us some context as to the reason why there's such a large percentage and differences, please? Yes, for our federal funds, um, again, that is made up of impact aid and also the JROTC. Um, that difference is mainly being driven by federal impact aid. So we budgeted at a certain amount, and then also what we expected to receive is, is different. So you see that difference incorporated there for the federal funds. Then as we move to our transportation costs, so any encumbrances that were legally um, entered into at the end of fiscal year 2021, those do carry forward into fiscal year 2022. So as those projects are completed, we then make the payment for those. So for technology, transportation, and operations and maintenance, those expenditures are higher because we were able to do more capital projects at the end of last school year and they were finished in this current school year. Okay, well, thank you. You're and welcome. then my third question uh, uh, relates to the transfer uh, to and from classification 68. And I see that there was a purchase of $64,000 for 200 football helmet replacement. Ms. Beth Mayer, can you pr provide some context for that? Yes, 10 years ago, the National Federation of High School Sports <coughs> made a rule that no longer, uh, t helmets cannot be more than 10 years old. Mm -hmm. And so 10 years ago, we gathered up our old, our old helmets and we, we threw them away and we bought 200 helmets. Well, 10 years have gone by, so those new helmets that we bought are now no good. Mm -hmm. So we had to buy some more. And uh, they're due fall of two. 2022, so that's why. And I think Mr. Samuels, if I could, yes. um, also yes. that came out of, of a situation where there was a, a lot of concern about concussion. Yes, ma'am. Concussion mm -hmm. protocol, mm -hmm. so that, that's how that started. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, You're Mr. Welcome. Mayor. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments from board members? Thank you again, Ms. Branch. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the school board, no further reports from the superintendent and staff. Thank you. All right. All right, next on the agenda is item number five, hearing of any delegations or presentations from any of any written communications or petitions. Ms. Bowers, would you please read the protocol? Citizens are invited to address the school boards on matters of public concern about the school division. Speaker forms are available prior to the start of the meeting. If you wish to address the school board, please complete the form and give it to the clerk. Each individual will have three minutes to speak. At the end of your time, you will hear a buzzer. All comments shall be directed to the school board. Speakers may not yield their time to another. Speakers should address the school board with decorum on policy issues. 
comments shall relate to agenda items or matters germane to the business or duties of the school board. Speakers comment on individuals at their own risk of violating confidentiality laws and or defaming the subjects of their comments. Neither the school board, the superintendent, nor the school administration will respond publicly to any comments by speakers about individuals. Presentation of resolutions, declarations, proclamations, manifestos, awards, or other similar documents not originated under the auspices of the school board or administration is prohibited during the public comment period. The audience is asked to be respectful of all speakers. Public comment is the school board's opportunity to listen to the speaker. Since our purpose is to hear from you, the board will not engage in dialogue with the audience or whomever is at the podium. Matters requiring a response will be directed to the superintendent for research and response. The superintendent may report back on such matters at a subsequent business meeting session as appropriate. The school board carefully considers your comments as we decide matters that are brought before us. We appreciate your attendance and your input. All right, thank you. I have two speakers this evening, and the first one is Mr. David Dietrich. Good evening, uh, members of the school board, Mr. Superintendent. My name is David Dietrich, 139 Wilderness Road in Hampton. <clears throat> First of all, I like uh, how uh, you've decided to change the longstanding policy of giving five minutes uh, to speakers. Obviously, you can't handle the uh, constructive criticism, so you're reducing that ability of citizens of Hampton to make, that, uh, make those statements. Next, on masks. How many of you, uh, I look around here today and just about everyone is still wearing a mask. How many of you watched the uh, president speak, your president speak uh, last night? Nobody was wearing a mask. Our virus is more dangerous in Washington than in this school system? I don't understand why I'm seeing what I'm seeing here. And, and this, this applies to the students. You sued the governor uh, so you could force students to continue wearing masks. Now that we have a law, you're no longer requiring that. It's all political theater is what it comes down to. It is not a health risk. It's political science, not medical science. And that's what we're seeing here even tonight. Uh, how, how are you helping this learning of the, the education of the students by forcing them to wear masks when you did? And now when you're wearing masks, how are you helping to, to promote your uh, agenda in this uh, particular forum? You're just, you're just basically damaging the image of this school system. Moving on to the, um, the mission of the school system. Used to have it posted up here. Uh, Hampton City Schools ensures academic excellence for every child, every day, whatever it takes. Well, how do you measure that excellence? How have you improved the lives of our children and where is the transparency in your evaluation? Still have not seen a single ag agenda item for these board meetings uh, addressing those issues. How do you maximize the learning of the students? And when it comes to the, uh, the school vision, success for every student, how do you measure that success? Have you made our child children more successful? If so, how? Why don't you tell the, the people of Hampton and, and, and other interested parties how, how you're doing so well? Draw more attention to your school system, but you don't. You, don't, you, concentrate, you focus on everything other than the education of the students at these school board meetings. And it's, it's very obvious uh, how you're doing that. We need a new direction for our school system here. Stop, with all, with all this stuff you're teaching, besides actually the basics, you're teaching all these racist policies. Stop te treating black children like they're inferior. If, if you tell somebody they're inferior, they're gonna believe they're inferior. Tell them they're the best person in the world, and they're gonna be that, they're gonna strive for that. That's the problem with all this ancillary indoctrination instead of actually educating our children. But we've got to get away from that and, and, and focus on what's really important uh, for these children. Thank you very kindly and have a good night. Next we have Mr. Craig Knott. Good afternoon, school board. Uh, my name is Craig Knopf and uh, superintendent, sorry about that. Um, glad to see you guys are all doing well. Um, basically, a couple questions. Uh, I sent an email out earlier, I think on Friday, 
asking them if we had gotten the bill yet for the mask mandate. Um, I got a reply back that we have not gotten it yet. Um, I just want to make sure, and I'll, I'll send an email as well. I just want to make sure that I am not miswording something not to get the bill, and that, that, that if it has been received. So um, I'm going to send an email asking whether I've read, if I've worded it correctly, if I need to address the lawyers that are in it, Blankenship and Keith, or do I need to address um, sending FOIA requests out to the six other schools asking whether they have received the bill as well. Um, <clears throat> also, another concern I have is the money that we have put aside for this, or that we will put aside, I guess, if we haven't received the bill yet, um, where are we pulling that money from? Um, that, that's, a, that's a definitely a concern. Do we have a um, fund set up that handles these type of lawsuits? Is it money that we're moving out from another issue that needs to be addressed? Um, I normally don't go to school board meetings. Normally I go to city council meetings. I can almost be found at almost every city council meeting. Um, but I have concerns and I've come here and I've seen a few. Um, but what I've also been learning is there's a lot of programs going on here. And it's, uh, this is awesome. I love coming to these things. I learn a lot. I see a lot of stuff going on in the school here. Um, see programs that are going on, see programs that could possibly need a little bit of help here and there. Uh, one of the programs, a couple, I think two, two sessions ago or something like that, um, one of the ladies came and was talking about flex and another lady came and she was talking about the bridge program. Bridge program, I guess, ends at the end of the fiscal school year and then it goes, summer passes and then it starts back up to the next school year. Now, one of the things that the lady had brought up is that, uh, I don't remember if anybody had addressed it, I think somebody had asked about it, I don't remember who it was, but uh, whether that continued through summer, or maybe it's just something I, I'm thinking about, but uh, that may be an issue there that we could have used that money towards. So I think that's one of the things that we probably need to look towards. Um, <laughs> me, myself, I think it's a waste of money. I do think it was politically driven, but that's just my thoughts. Um, maybe you guys have other issues that you wanted to address with that, but um, that's all I have. Uh, all my concerns I will just go ahead and address with in an email. Um, appreciate it. Thank you. You guys have a good night. All right. Thank you, Mr. Knapp. Moving forward, we move to item number six for deliberation. Item 6.01, student fees for 2022-2023, and item 6.02, 2022-2023 school calendar and 2023-2024 planning calendar. We've already discussed the planning calendar. Uh, for our student fees, we'll ask Ms. Branch if she would come forward and uh, she will give an overview of the student fees in terms of the deliberation. And then uh, Dr. Maxwell uh, presented the uh, proposed calendar. Thank you. Yes, good evening again. Um, as part of the student fees that are recommended for next school year, um, I've highlighted where there is a recommended addition in blue. And those additions include um, SCA dues, a young ladies um, and young gentlemen club dues, Lego club dues, and holiday craft club at two of our elementary schools. And then also a highlighted in red, the removal of student fees that are no longer applicable. Mm -hmm. um, those include the removal of the book or bag replacement, also the removal of a culinary arts student fee, and then also, I've just highlighted that for our career, career and technical student organization fees, that those are subject to change just based on what the national level organization set those fees as. So I just put a footnote within our student fee schedule to explain that. Mm -hmm. And that it concludes all of the changes that are recommended for next school year. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any questions from board members on either the either one of those reports, the school fees or the student fees, or either one of the um, reports that we heard earlier with the um, school calendar and the planning calendar? Thank you again, Miss Miss wow. Branch. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get it. I'm going to get it. All right. Next item number seven: items for action. Seven point zero one: revision of school board policy IGCB. Alternative, alternative course completion, 7.02. Review of school board policy IIAA, 
textbook selection and adoption, 7.03, revision of school board policy IICA, field trips, excursions, and overnight field trips, 7.04, review of school board policy IKAB, student progress reports to parents, 7.05, revision of school board policy IKAD, parent conferences pre-K through 12, 7.06, revision of school board policy IKC, eight high school class rank and course weight, 7.07, .07, revision of school board policy IKEB, acceleration, 7.08, review of school board policy IKFA, locally awarded verified credits, 7.09, review of school board policy ILA slash ILB, test, test selection and adoption test administration, item 7.10, review of school board policy ILC, use and dissemination of test results, 7.11, review of school board policy IM, evaluation of instructional programs, 7.12, review of school board policy JCJ, classroom assignments for twins. Is there a motion? Take these as a block. Chair Mason, I move that we approve action items 7.01 through 7.12 as a block. Second. Okay. All right, it's been properly moved, motion and seconded by uh, Mr. Kilgore and seconded by Ms. Uh, Fonja that we approve item seven, action items as a block. Any discussion? Ms. Bowers, please call for the vote. Ms. Cherry? Aye. Mr. Kilgore? Aye. Mr. Samuels? Aye. Dr. Woodhouse? Aye. Ms. Lafonja? Aye. Ms. Banks Gray? Aye. Dr. Mason? Aye. Motion carries. All right. Next, deliberation first read item 8.01, revision of school board policy GCBDA sick leave. And there's Ms. Ruth. I didn't see you earlier. <laughs> Oops. Good evening. Yeah. And as Ms. Branch, uh, mentioned during the budget presentation, we do have a revision to our sick leave policy, specifically the payout of sick leave upon resignation. Um, the top of the policy says that updates begin on page four. If you've printed it out, it, they may not begin until page five. Mm -hmm. um, when I printed mine out, the first line was on page five. So. But that, um, so we just removed um, the effective date of June 2020 for another change that we had made last year. So we're striking that. And then when you look towards the bottom of the page, um, currently, if you resign from Hampton City Schools, you are only eligible to transfer your sick leave if you are going to another Virginia school division, and that option will remain. Um, and then your unused sick leave that is not transferred would be held in an account for five years. If you return to Hampton City Schools, it would be placed back you know, in your leave bucket when you return. If you don't return, then it was uh, transferred to the sick leave bank. We are deleting that language and we are replacing it with uh, for employees who have been with Hampton City Schools within five and nine consecutive years. Uh, will still be able to transfer their sick leave, but they will also be eligible for payout of 50% of their unused leave at $30 a day. If they have been with the school division 10 or more consecutive years, then they'll be eligible for 100% payout of the days, again, at $30, $30 a day. And that is exclusive of any leave that would be transferred to another um, another Virginia school division. Um, if an employee leaves us with less than five consecutive years of service, we will continue to hold their leave. We're changing the length of time from five years to three years. And the reason for that change, um, Virginia code considers you to have left the teaching profession if you leave teaching and don't return to a teaching position within three years. And so we've just um, are matching Virginia code. Um, so that's the reason for the change in the length of time. Um, we have added a caveat. Um, if an active employee passes away while 
um, in service to Hampton City Schools. Uh, they will receive payout uh, of their unused sick leave, $30 a day still, but at 100% regardless of their tenure with Hampton City Schools. So if they've been here a year, they'll get 100%. If they've been here 20 years, they would get 100%. Um, and again, at the bottom of page six, we just changed um, from, uh, took out the language about keeping it in a bank for five years. And we have also, uh, the last paragraph on page seven, uh, we have removed the requirement that employees have to transfer sick leave within 90 days of their employment with Hampton mm -hmm. City Schools. We have removed that time limit because sometimes you know, school systems, the beginning of the year, it may take them a little longer than 90 days to let us know that Daisy Duck has 90 days to transfer. Mm -hmm. So those are all of the changes to the policy. Okay. Right. Any clarifying questions from board members? All right. Thank you, Ms. Thank Rose. you very much. Mm -hmm. All right. And now we have arrived at that point for information. Our next meetings. Let's pull that up real quick for you all. Uh, our next meeting will be public hearings for the fiscal 2022-2023 budget um, year, which will be at 6.30 here at Jones on March the 9th, March the 16th and March the 16th here at Jones. And that those meetings are specifically for uh, budget concerns, budget questions, as the budget will be presented to the community at that time. All right. Mr. Smith. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, again, we're grateful for all of the members of the, the budget team and, and their whole hard work. And again, it's, it is an investment uh, in terms of our, our young people and the ongoing success uh, that our young people experience in Hampton City Schools. And we're grateful to be able to represent uh, over 18,000 young people and their families uh, and their academic success. And uh, for example, uh, the wise investment and the support of this community, uh, it has demonstrated that uh, in 2015, we had 42% of our schools fully accredited. And uh, for the academic year of 1920, 100% of our schools fully accredited. Our on-time graduation rate uh, for 2015 was 88%. And for the class of 2021, 96.8%. Mm -hmm. uh, we had nearly 1,500 graduates. Our dropout rate in 2008 was 14%. In 2015, it was 5%. Currently, for the class of 2021, it is 0.34%. Uh, and the state dropout rate for the class of 2021 uh, was 4.3%. So I think we have a lot to celebrate uh, when it comes to the success of our young people. Thank you, Dr. Smith, for showing us how we are measuring success here in Hampton, and we are doing some great things here in Hampton City Schools. Any other comments or point of information from board members? Ms. Fonja? I would just like to piggyback on what um, Dr. Smith just talked about, the success of our students and the academic and the curriculum success. And I got firsthand to witness um, that in a two day, I'll call it a workshop. I think it was supposed to be a training, but we worked so hard that <laughs> it was really a workshop. Um, but at the two days, Monday and Tuesday of this week, the division held a middle school transformation visioning um, and framing workshop, and it was just phenomenal to see how the, the energy of the administrators, the teachers, the business partners that gathered in that um, space to really look at how the academies of Hampton can be applied to the middle school students. And it was just a, a huge brainstorming effort, um, and it was so collaborative and so interactive and um, so much information was taken from that, from that experience, not only from myself or the business partners, um, but the teachers and administrators. And I just seem to be a real energy around the academies of Hampton that um, has been intentional and deliberate from the division leadership team, from the school board. Um, and it, that Ms. Hurd kept saying that she wanted, that the goal was for the academies of Hampton and Hampton City Schools 
basically to be synonymous. So every time you hear Hampton City Schools, you'll automatically think of the academies of Hampton. Mm -hmm. And that type of thought transitioning and cognitive transitioning was very evident in the room um, with the folk that were there. It was just mm -hmm. really a good experience. It was a great experience. Um, I was happy to be a part of it. And I just wanted to give kudos to all those who were involved in the planning of it. Um, the implementation of it. I'm just really excited about the opportunities for our middle schoolers beginning next year. So it's not anything that's being projected out for years and years. This is something that's going to happen immediately. And beginning next year, the academies of Hampton, um, a lot of that focus will be in our middle schools. And, and our students will be able to become more self-aware, will be connected to their communities in a greater way. Um, they'll benefit from the businesses and the service organizations that are in our community that will have a major impact on our middle school students and i'm just excited about it happy to be a part of it and the staff that um, did it and put it on did did a phenomenal job it was mm -hmm. really really good, good. really really good thank you any, any other women mr samuels uh thank you chair mason thank you chairman mason mm -hmm. And the question was also asked earlier, and I just would like to piggyback on what Dr. Smith said. How do we measure success in Hampton City School? Last school year, we had 26 students to graduate Hampton City School with their associate's degree before they graduate with their high school diploma. Thank you. That's how Hampton City School is measuring success. Exactly. And on a calmer notice, note, People may be wondering why I'm wearing my Norfolk State mask. I think we. Know. It is because <laughs> Norfolk State University just won the MEAC conference yeah. and will be number one in the MEAC tournament started in two weeks. So behold, <laughs> the green and the gold. That's right. We'll celebrate our Hampton City School students that actually go to Norfolk State. That's it. Those are the only ones we'll celebrate. <laughs> and Dr. Mason, we have a few. Hampton City School students from last school year mm -hmm. attended Norfolk State University, including my daughter, who is in the pre-nursing program, a very competitive program mm -hmm. at Norfolk State. Mm -hmm. Once again, how do we measure success yes. in Hampton City Schools? Thank you, yes. Any other board members? If I, 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 I failed to mention that uh, I received a call yesterday um, from uh, Mr. Gil Bland, uh, who's the CEO for Urban League, mm -hmm. and uh, he wanted to uh, wanted us to know that uh, Xavier continues to do exceptional work. That he's now serving on the JMU uh, mm -hmm. Board of Trustees or Visitors as the mm -hmm. student rep, mm -hmm. and you will recall that Xavier served as the student rep on the school yes. board, and he will be featured on the Urban League's. Um, uh, homepage in terms of uh, his work at JMU mm -hmm. and so forth. So just a proud moment uh, in terms of a, a continued success story, certainly with Xavier. Yes, yes. He's definitely doing a great job at uh, James Madison representing Hampton City Schools in the city of Hampton. Mm -hmm. All right. oh. With no further business, I declare this meeting adjourned.